Good morning. I'm Wren Smith, Interpretive Programs Manager for Bernheim, and I'm here with our amazing volunteer naturalist, Joe Rogers. And I'm asking him some questions today about shagbark kickery and shellbark kickery. And so anyway, let me just begin to ask those questions and see what he's got to say about them. Okay, Joe, first, why would somebody want to know what shagbark and, sh and uh, shellbark kickery trees are? Why, why would they want to know that? Well, the shagbark and shellbark, number one, provides a wonderful food source for our wildlife. Uh, you can see the shedding of the nuts this time of year on the ground, and the large king nut are the shellbark, and the smaller nut of the shagbark. So these provide wonderful food for wildlife and for humans. Uh, they have a really high oil content, uh, monosaturated fats which are healthy, and we make a lot of baked goods with these nuts as well as the uh, as the, the food for wildlife when they're now falling to the ground and getting ready to fatten up for the winter. So you know timing is a perf perfect for wildlife that's getting ready to go into dormancy. So the that's, next thing, that's an important thing, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. So getting all fattened up. Yes. And I guess that happens to us too we sometimes over the winter holidays. Yes, exactly. So, okay. <laughs> so I know there are a lot of different reasons and you might speak about them too, but I think one of the things that is often very confusing for people is how do you tell the difference between a shag bark and a shell bark? It seems like to me, I would want to know what a shag bark looks like compared to a shell bark because the shell bark has bigger nuts right. to gather. And you know, that's kind of a, if I'm foraging for food, I might want to want to go for that. Well, one thing that you will find on the location, typically you don't find as many the king nuts or the shell bark as you do the shag bark. Uh, typically the, uh, Shell bark will grow in, say, bottom land, real deep. They have a long tap root in order to anchor themselves, as well as the other uh, uh, trees. Both, both both species have a long tap root. But you'll find uh, you'll find shag bark sometime uh, in in the upper reaches, along the base of knobs, in the upper reaches, and more so. More but, upland. Yeah, more upland tree. But the thing about it is, is you don't know what one you, which ones you have likely during the winter time, but during the summer, when it's during the growing season, you can tell the difference by this particular rule that we'll talk about, the characteristics, is that the shag bark has five leaflets per leaf because there's where it's hooked, uh, it's connected to the dormant bud, and this is a full leaf. These are called leaflets, which we have a five, on the king nut or the shell bark, it is connected at the dormant bud, and it's a little longer leaf, and typically has about seven leaflets. Now, generally, that's the case as we study it, but always in exceptions to rules. It get, becomes a little more confusing to identify them in the winter, but it you can kind of determine that maybe from the type of the bark that you see. I think shell bark maybe even have more has more shagginess than the shag bark. And I, you're so right about the fact that nature doesn't necessarily follow our rules. And no. you know, you might be looking at the leaves and say, well, this has five, it must be such and such, or this has seven, it must be such right. and such in it. And it's like, well, sometimes yeah, nature sometimes. Always just, exceptions to yes. every rule. I, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the hickories. We can go out, whether it be wildlife and colors and anything. There are many exceptions to, you know, I, I see it in wildflowers, I see it in shrubs, that you will say, based on the historic information that we've learned over time, but as plants and animals evolve, changes always are occurring okay. in nature. And they're kin to pecans, right? Yeah, oh yes, they're both in the, what we call the Jugulaceae family, which is pecans, hickories, and walnuts. Mm -hmm. Now there's an interesting little story that I would like to uh, make light of. Besides wildlife using the nuts for fattening up squirrels, etc., uh, insects also use the plants of the Jugulinaceae family. And there's one in particular that's a little bit what I'll call devilish. Uh, 
we'll call the hickory horn devil. Even though the caterpillar is harmless, it's very interesting to look at and quite uh, macabre when you take a look at it. Yeah. But, but it is friendly. It's about the size of a hot dog and yes. kind of green, big, bigger than the uh, tomato hornworms. Exactly. Well, if you see be. one, you'll never forget it. But it's the larva of the uh, royal walnut moth. Those are so cool. They are wonderful. So, yes. yeah, so I think it's always important to think about those connections, this food web that yes. is connected to everything. And you're so good about bringing that to our attention and how important all of these right. things are. In the total ecosystem, we deal with all wildlife. And, and humans are even connected to that as well because of the, the, the uh, food value and the timber and the oxygen that the trees produce for us to breathe. So it's all interconnected. Once we lose, start losing species, we are damaging, you know, uh, life in the long run. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Good thank you, Rena. I enjoyed it.